Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. ...on uh, 3D video, which I think you can ask him about offline afterwards if you're interested. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, yeah, so as uh, Rick already said, uh, my talk will be about automated reconstruction of 3D city models. And I'm actually um, show you the final result right away from the beginning. So uh, it's in fact not that I want to make you leave early because you've seen the best already, <laughs> but it's as I um, told already, Rick, uh, there's some problems with the drivers. So if I show it afterwards, there's some artifacts when showing movies. So this was what we'll have in the end. It's a 3D city model that, as you can see here, is texture mapped. And you can fly around it and can uh, look at everything. But what's nice about this model is that it's not only has the aerial part of it and it's a coarse resolution, but you can zoom, zoom in a lot. And it has uh, a lot of details. So you can go down to the street levels all the way and you can see individuals, individual uh, parts of the building facade. I can show you other areas as well. This is here one of my favorites too. Because it, it shows uh, what Berkeley is all about. <laughs> Independent uh, movies. So, uh, yeah. W term? What is that? Is that a George W. term, Dominic? I never no, that was that. actually, I acquired this data in 2001. So that was, uh, actually, yeah, it might be. <laughs> yes. Uh, so as you can see, we have a lot of details here at the ground level. And you can uh, walk through these models and look at all the buildings, get the individual details on the facade. And it's a fused model that essentially has these ground-based uh, data and images but also it has airborne data from the top. And uh, what I'm talking about in this um, uh, talk is how we acquire those types of data and how we process them to fuse them <coughs> together to make a model like that. This entire model here was generated completely automatically, so without manual <coughs> intervention. That's also nice about it. And our processing algorithms are reasonably fast. It took, for this model, about um, the, the ground-based driving time was 11 minutes, and the processing time was about two and a half uh, hours. So, so it's two and a half hours was the processing time, the processing time. Okay. and the acquisition time was only 11 minutes. So uh, it, our approach, and I will talk about those uh, things in detail, is very fast and it's automated. That's that's something special about it. So let me close all this, and I'll uh, start with my talk. Okay, so first I want to do some acknowledgement about other people that were involved in this project. Uh, the forefront every day is a core, who is the director of the video and image processing lab. <laughs> then uh, some students, John Flynn, Sida Jane, and uh, Ali Lakia, and Russell Salmon. I also want to acknowledge the Army Research Office, which uh, funded us for the last, no, almost four, five years, this project. So as I already said, the goal is to reconstruct a 3D city model, which is usable for both a, a walkthrough and a flythrough, not only one or the other. And um, you can imagine a lot of uh, applications for that, virtual reality, urban planning, all these things, special effects, car navigation. And the objectives that we had for this uh, project was that we wanted to do it in uh, completely or uh, as automated as possible. And it turns out we can do it completely. And um, it should be fast and scalable uh, to large areas, uh, which is essential if you want to model an entire city. And obviously, we want to have good results. We want to have something that's photorealistic, or at least uh, as realistic as possible. And our approach to that is we have two different um, uh, acquisition modes, uh, modalities. We have a ground-based modeling and acquisition approach, 
which is mainly intended to acquire building facades at high resolution. And then we also have an airborne modeling approach, which essentially uh, gives us the terrain and the building top, which is missing really in the ground-based uh, acquisition. And we fuse those two modalities together in a 3D city model. And the, in that process, the registration is, is also a very important aspect. Let me first start with the, our ground-based uh, uh, model acquisition system. So we have uh, come up uh, with an approach which we call drive-by scanning. And, and that's the key that why our approach is so fast. So rather than the, the traditional approach that you have a laser uh, scan, a laser scanner that gives you a 3D scan, you take the scan, move to a different location, take another scan, and you try to stitch them together in the end. We, dry, uh, dry, uh, we intend to just acquire the whole geometry while driving by. Because essentially the uh, original uh, uh, stop and go fashion is very slow. It takes minutes to acquire a 3D scan and, and it's just not feasible to, uh, to cover a large area sufficiently. So th um, we have developed a system that can be mounted on a truck and you can say, see that here. Um, so we have uh, this truck here, on, uh, and we have our acquisition system mounted on top of a rack so that we can overlook cars and up obstacles that are on the way. And our system consists of two 2D laser scanners and a digital camera, and those devices are synchronized with each other. And we uh, just drive around now under normal traffic conditions in a city. What's the field of view on the camera? That's about uh, 90 degree in the widest, so it's a wide angle camera. The way it works is, so we use 2D laser scanners instead of 3D laser scanners. So we, we essentially scan along one vertical line as shown here at any given time. And then we just move our truck and scan essentially line by line by line. Uh, at the same time, we take uh, the, the pictures from the camera synchronized with that. And the big question is, uh, how do we localize our vehicle? Um, how do we know where we are when we take those, um, those uh, data? And uh, it turns out that we can solve that by using an, an, an another 2D laser scanner, which is mounted horizontally. And uh, I'll come to that, how we exactly use that for localization. So this horizontal scanner, the nice thing about that is uh, the scans overlap. We move a bit, and because uh, we, uh, we don't move uh, a lot compared to the range of the scanner, we can have still a lot of overlap between those scans. And that's what you can see here. These are two scans taken at two different uh, times, T0 and T1. Now, if we put them in the same coordinate system and apply a specific translation and rotation, you can see they maximally overlap. And that's obviously exactly the translation and rotation that our vehicle had uh, when acquiring the data. Uh, now, in order to find the overlap between a subsequent uh, pair of uh, scans, we, uh, we use an automated uh, uh, method of scan matching, which uh, there are several approaches out there in the literature. Essentially, we take one scan, extract line features, we, uh, match, the other we match the points of the other scan to those line features, and then uh, we compute a quality function, and you can now search and optimize through that quality function in order to uh, find the best pose. It's fairly quick, actually, to do that. And uh, it's, it's actually very accurate, too. Typically, we get something like a centimeter accuracy. And, and the orientation is even more accurate to 0.01 degree, typically. Now, once you have these relative steps from one scan to the other, you can simply uh, join them to, to form the path and re reconstruct the trajectory. And that's what you see here. So these little green arrows here are step by step. It's almost about 80 centimeters or a meter between them. And uh, we just put them one after the other. And this is the reconstructed driven path that we have. And what you see here in blue is the horizontal scan points as seen from every scan. And they all superimposed on top of each other. And you can see that uh, that's locally extremely accurate. Because if you make just a small error here in your post, they would be all blurred out. But they are not. So that means the pose is uh, pretty good. However, uh, these, even these local errors, uh, the, these, these small uh, errors, this high accuracy, drifts away if you drive for a longer period. 
And that's what you can see here. So this is the reconstructed path for 78 minutes driving time in 24 kilometers. So we start here, and uh, uh, you, what you see in gray, by the way, is the DSM of the Berkeley area, so a, a height profile. And you can see in the beginning, we follow the road somewhat nicely, but the longer we drive, the more turns we make, we drift away. And uh, at this point, we start to lose entirely the track of where we actually drive. And if you uh, just follow these relative pose uh, trajectory, then uh, you're all over the place in the end. Have you thought about tying in with GPS? We don't u didn't use a GPS, but I'll, I'll show our correction algorithms afterwards. There's some issues with, with GPS, and, uh, and the way we solve it is I think it's actually nicer. And I, I'll come to that in a, in a minute. So for, to register your 2D um, scans, right. do you make the assumption that you're on flat ground? Because otherwise... Um, in, yes, yes and no. So uh, our approach works overall in uh, uneven terrain. And uh, even on hills, that's not a problem. But for uh, just this 2D match, we assume uh, uh, that our predominant motion is on a, a 2D surface. Um, as I'll show you later, there's, uh, it, we, it, uh, we can still track our position correctly <coughs> in hilly areas too. And the reason for that is because we have correction algorithms that take that into account. Um, so as you, as you see here, we are all over the place and, and that makes it uh, necessary to have a global correction. And, and GPS would definitely be one, be one solution. But um, we had a different idea and that's um, we actually use airborne data in order to correct for this error in the ground-based pose. And uh, I can tell you what the good thing about that is, because later on, um, airborne data, such as a digital surface uh, model, a DSM, or an airborne uh, image can be used to uh, reconstruct an airborne model. And if we use that as a global reference and correct our path so that it fits optimally to this, we have already inherently registered both modalities with each other. Whereas if you have a GPS that sometimes can even fail in, in uh, urban canyons where you don't have good uh, signals, and you have, again, the model taken from a different GPS readout, they might not perfectly align. Yeah. So uh, our principal idea is that we'll detect uh, edges in the DSM or in an aerial image, and uh, uh, we assume that these edges correspond to facades that are also visible in the ground-based scans. And we want to uh, try to maximize the overlap between those uh, two sources of data. Uh, the first thing that we do is we uh, create an edge map uh, from, from those data sources, this airborne data sources, and, and that's fairly uh, simple. Um, you can simply use uh, a Sobel edge detector. And, uh, and then we define a congruence coefficient, which essentially um, tells us for a given position, how well do the scan points as taken from that position fit to our global, um, global uh, data source? So that's shown here. This little dot here is a hypothetical position of our acquisition vehicle. And what you see in black here are the scan points um, as to, uh, seen from that uh, location. And, uh, and, and what's here in gray is edges from, the, in this case, I think it's an aerial image. And you can see that depending on the position, those points fit better or, or worse. In this case, they fit better. And then we have a congru congruence coefficient that's higher. And here they fit uh, less. And that's why our coefficient is lower. And the way our uh, coefficient is defined is we just simply sum up the intensity uh, we, uh, of, uh, for each scan point. We project each scan point into our DSM. And then we sum up the intensity of the edge at that location. You're sort of assuming your aerial image is a nadir image here, are you? Sorry? You're assuming that it's sort of like a nadir pointing image, right? Right, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that's oblique. exactly. Yeah, you can take an oblique aerial image for that. But there's, you know, there are databases even on the web where you can get these, uh, these rectified images. And, and our images in this case were too. We were top-down images. So uh, now that we have our, our map of the area as a DSM, we, uh, uh, we uh, use Monte Carlo localization in order to uh, register and localize our uh, truck within that map. 
Essentially, uh, Monte Carlo localization uh, is a probabilistic approach that has been uh, uh, developed in the context of mobile robots uh, localizing themselves in an indoor environment. And uh, it's a specific uh, particle filtering implementation of a more general localization approach with Markov localization, which essentially is, uh, assumes that there's, um, uh, and that's the Markov assumption, that you're in a static environment and that your sensor readout just depends on your position and not on the history. And we can fairly assume that in our case too. The city doesn't change so fast. <laughs> now we extended this approach that it works in outdoor environments with uh, DSMs and aerial images uh, as uh, the global map. And um, well, I so this, this is the math behind it. I, I don't want to go into details here. Essentially, we have two steps. We have an observation step and a, a motion step. And uh, they both uh, modify a probability distribution as uh, where we think we are. And I'll just explain that in a, in a, uh, in a one-day example. Say you assume uh, that my position of the vehicle is this. And you don't assume one single value, but a distribution as the belief is where you think you are. And this is just in the one-dimensional case in the x direction. So that's what you start with at one step. And then you have a motion uh, phase, <clears throat> which is essentially from your horizontal scan match, these little vectors that you have, you know I moved along, say, a meter in one direction. And uh, that also has some uncertainty, because the scan match is never perfect. So you, have, you convolute those two probabilities and you, what you get is a new uh, belief function that's, um, uh, which centers basically moved by that one meter, but which is also slightly spread out because you increase the uncertainty. But now comes another step, and that's a perception phase, where you now look how well does my pose uh, fit, or each uh, hypothetical pose fits to the global observation. And in this case, how well does, do the scan points fit to the airborne reference? And you reshape that, uh, your original belief from here with that observation probability. And that resharpens uh, your probability density. So that's a way of always spreading it out, looking how I am, and then resharpening it and spreading out the next step. So iteratively, that's how you go. And this is all represented as particles, this distribution. And I'll show you uh, this here in a movie. So what we do is we. <coughs> We initialize our position with just some random particles. And each particle, is, as, as I said, represents a probability space. In this case, it's a three parameter x, y, and orientation. We start somewhat uniformly here in an area. And then we have the DSM, and we'll just move it along uh, according to our observations and our relative steps. Let me show that here to you. So you can quickly see that it uh, shapes to what looks like a fried egg. <laughs> so we're moving here along this relative estimates, and we compare this to the edges. And you'll see that in a, in a minute. So here, this is the edge view. And now what's here in green are the horizontal scan points that it sees from, from each position. And as we move along, it constantly changes the shape according to how well it fits. And there will actually be a situation where we make a slight error in our post, and it will recover from that. I think it's about here. Yeah, you see there's a, there's a small error. Now it leaks out because uncertainty increases. And then it turns out it, uh, it uh, recreates a new center because all these, these particles that fit well to this observation get boosted. That's how we can, can track our position. Now once we have this set of uh, probab... Oh, OK. So it looked like your distribution was fairly uniform. Right, for your particles. No, it can be, uh, no, it can, uh, that's in this case because it's pretty good. Right. But it can uh, develop multiple hypotheses. Well, that's what I was curious about because a lot of the work that, you know, the people like, like Peter Fox and, and those guys do, you develop multiple modes because it's, it's a very unconstrained situation and they're not sure which corridor they're coming back to. But, you know, this looked like a single column filter would, would work. Right? Uh, just no, it loop. doesn't. Actually, it does not because that's how we started out. Uh -huh. um, the truth is, in a DSM, which uh, all your edges are fairly good, uh -huh. um, you probably could get away with Kalman filter, at least mu multiple hypothesis Kalman filter. 
um, what I just showed that that one moment where uh, essentially there was one probability peak that leaked out into another one is already a case where you might get into difficulties but if you set your uncertainty wide enough you might still catch it but um, where it completely fails with all these um, just common filter based approaches is in, for an aerial image because uh -huh. then you have a lot of bad edges okay. shadows and things like that typically and uh, very few good ones and um, especially in residential areas where there's not clear lines mm -hmm. for buildings then um, you track the wrong, wrong one and you're lost forever you'll never recover so that's why we started this uh, particle filtering uh, based approach because the other one approaches didn't work. Okay. Yeah. But then later on we switched to the DSM and it turns out you need a lot less particles. For example, this was 5,000 particles, um, 5 or 10,000. And for the aerial image you need more in the range of 100,000 particles because it's just a, a, you know, a big uncertainty that you have to cover and track dense enough. So once you have all these probability distributions, you can bend your path so that it fits optimally to those probability distributions and essentially correct for the errors that you, you've made in uh, for the relative scan matching. And uh, this is again the old result, and this is what you get after correction. And you can see now that it's globally registered and it's also consistent with each other because it's essentially registered to the same type of uh, global reference. And uh, that also is on the, on the ground level the same. What's shown in yellow here are the uh, ground-based horizontal scan points. And they align nicely with the edges, which is here. I think I have a closer view here, which is not right sharp. The reason why you see it, it's a little bit wider here is because you have just a lot, a lot of scan points where there's multiple objects. Say in this case, here, for example, you scan into a restaurant. This is, this is a restaurant in downtown Berkeley. So we see the uh, internal building walls, too, and lamps and whatever is there. OK, so now that we know where we are, we can simply start creating the actual models and using the vertical laser scanner, which has not been used so far, to, uh, to uh, uh, reconstruct the, the scan points for the facades. And that's what's shown here. So we just, if we know the position, we can just put them in 3D space. And you can see that uh, our scans are quite detailed. So they have objects like cars and street signs, uh, some pedestrians, two trees, and of, of course the building facades too. Now, now I'll, come, uh, I'll go to the automated uh, facade reconstruction process, essentially how to turn the, the raw point cloud into a texture mapped uh, model. And uh, first of all, simply triangulating uh, those scan points is not a very good idea. And the reason is because you get a lot of foreground objects which uh, are very cluttered. And you see those only from one side. Yeah? So here are the, all the foreground objects. And even though it still looks somewhat reasonable from here, once you go down on the street level and look from the side, it's not looking good at all. Because uh, you, you, you never get the backside, it's individual scan points floating in the air. So this is not good for a walkthrough uh, if you want to have really a somewhat realistic experience. So our idea is we re remove the uh, first those foreground clutters and just reconstruct the facades. And we do this in several steps. So the first one is we uh, transform those scan points into depth image. And uh, then we apply some analysis, histogram and other kind of things, in order to determine what are the, the dominant features here, where are walls, and, uh, and try to find what's the, the foreground and what's the background. And uh, so we separate then our image into layers. And we process the background layer, uh, which we assume <coughs> are the facades, and fill in holes. And it's actually a series of steps that involves segmentation. You have erroneous scan points uh, that's still floating somewhere behind, for example. They're actually not always erroneous. It's just scan points that you don't want to have. A, scan, a laser typically penetrates the window and just scans what's behind it. So you get all these ceilings, scan points, and you want to remove those. So there's a lot of heuristics involved, too. It segment it out and re determine what scan points are good and bad. In the end, we come out with a clean background layer that um, has just a facade and has uh, the holes filled. 
and I have this as a as a small movie. So you can see this is uh, illustrates hole filling. Actually, uh, th we in truth we do it the opposite way. We first remove the foreground and then fill the holes. But it's uh, in, in the movie it's shown like this. So you see that we just remove this cluttered stuff that's behind and replace it what we think is probably a good guess. Yeah, so in front of the building sometimes? This here, you mean? Well, it was out the windows before. There were these things that were sticking out a lot near some of the windows. This here thing? Uh, well, that's an awning. Mm, well, I can restart it. Uh -huh. Where is it? So when we get to the two-story building. Uh -huh. Okay, now, here? yes, right oh, this looks points. like a fire escape. Oh, okay, that's what they yeah. were. Those <laughs> were the things escapes. I could recognize. Okay. Yeah. So, so you're basically like covering the windows as if there were paint on the windows? Is that that's your... right. Okay. Well, I mean, it's, we want to create a model that looks most realistic. And if you see a CD, you would see that there's a window and a reflection. So we don't want to have just the hole, and, and that's why we're filling it. Obviously, if you fill in something that's not there, you might be wrong. You also fill up a door entrance or you know, some, some passageway, maybe, if it's small enough. But, um, but still, even if you texture map that afterwards, it won't look too bad, even if you close the door. So. And this is the foreground removal. Actually, you can see also this is an old version. I still just use the same movie. We remove here parts of the building too, like some yawning. But uh, we improved on that. So now this is perfect. Uh, we wouldn't remove those anymore. I just still have the same movie because it's difficult to make a new movie all the time. So these are um, as a result uh, before and after. You can see that we removed uh, this foreground clutter and smoothed it somewhat out. And here's another result. Um, I wouldn't claim it looks perfect, but it looks a lot better than just the raw scan points that you get. OK, uh, now comes the texture mapping part. Now, um, as I said, we have this camera mounted on top of this truck, too. And it's synchronized. So that means if we know our position at any given time, we know also exactly where we have uh, taken the image from. And it's pre-calibrated with a laser system. So that is actually a nice property because it makes a texture mapping straightforward. Um, you don't have to find registration. You just slab it on. And um, that's what we do here. The only catch is we have to deal with the foreground now because we removed it in the image, uh, in, the, in the 3D model. And we just want to texture map the facades. We can't just slab on the image that would put that tree on the building. So to solve this, uh, what we do is we know the foreground in the geometry. Now we project all the geometry into the image, and now we blank out all spaces that belong to foreground. That's, that's the principal um, idea. And uh, then we select which, which image is best based on normal vector and, <coughs> and size in the image area. Now um, we have this, some more details about it, and essentially, uh, after projection, you also have the problem that not all foreground is captured by the laser. For example, if, uh, because the laser has more the direct view, sometimes you don't see side walls, or sometimes the resolution of the laser is just not enough, and you have some more things in the image. So we have here, for example, there's still a remainder of the tree, and we also deal with those uh, in order to get rid of them, and use kind of flood filling and color constancy in order to uh, figure out whether something uh, that's near a foreground object still belongs to foreground or, or the background. And uh, yeah, essentially what that leaves us out is uh, we'll remove those foreground objects. We usually remove slightly more, but because we have a series of image and a lot of them look behind what's there, that doesn't matter so much. It's better to remove, uh, be a bit on the conservative side and remove a bit more than having some <coughs> artifacts later on in the building. And uh, once we know in each uh, image what we can, uh, can use of it, uh, we select what image is the best for each triangle, and we compose them in a, into a texture atlas. And uh, they are, as you can see, it's essentially a mosaic. And that mosaic is simple to create, because we have 
the registration, we don't even have to do some blending or anything, and they align nicely. How accurate is the registration between the laser scan and pictures and the images? Um, you mean in terms of pixels? Or? Well, whatever. Um, well, we calibrated it. So actually, if you ask me what, how accurate is the uh, orientation uh, in, in degrees or centimeters, I can't even tell you. Um, we used the output of our reg registration. In fact, we used uh, Microsoft's Easy Camera tool. And um, it, turns, it turns out that it's good enough that you don't see any cracks. So. What do you do about the shadow of foreground objects? The shadow? Yeah, the you mean objects. So like the, it's in there. You've removed the tree, but the right. Edges. The shadow is still there. Basically, we just take a snapshot then of what's there. So it's all the lighting conditions are in the model. We don't have any ways of saying. Uh, right now, we don't have way of uh, retrieving what's the BRDF, for example, or you know what is the properties. So what about areas where you actually couldn't get another view behind the? Right. Behind yes. The I'll come to that too. Actually, that's that's right here. We have a texture synthesis. Uh, algorithm that fills in this hole, and that was the work of uh, one of one of my students. So, um, uh, in this case, for example, there was a big tree, and even though we got most of it from some other viewpoint, there's still some uh, remainders. And then, uh, well, we have essentially two two texture synthesis steps. One is a fairly simple one, which is say if it's a small hole and it's in a in a low texture uh, area or the surrounding areas that don't have high frequency features, and we just smoothly interpolate it. That, that works actually often good enough. And the, the, our second approach, which takes a lot longer, is a copy and paste method. So for, uh, we go in a little window. We find here uh, what's white here is missing, so a missing area. And we search through the entire um, texture atlas whether we find a similar area, and we copy paste it from there. And you know you have to search through everything that, that takes uh, uh, some some longer time, but it, it fills in those holes more or less nicely. So, uh, the overall the areas where there's no texture map for for that downtown Berkeley uh, um, scene that we have, it's about only 1.5 percent of the pixels that are not texture map. Seems like we might get a. Have an easier time choosing which other area to copy and paste in that if you took into account the three D model as well. Um, uh, you mean, for example, one could say here I want to be within the same building or something. Within the same building, or even like in, in that particular area, if it's just bricks, it, it's going to be flat. Whereas if it's a window that's missing, then it might match a three D window. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, typically that doesn't work for for one reason, and that's in areas where you have no. Um, texture information, you even have less likely uh, scans. So the scans in this area are interpolated. So whereas here, I'm sure you have the 3D structure of the window. But here, it's probably just uh, relatively smooth, because it has been filled in by planar interpolation. Or we have uh, several sets of interpolation that fill it in. So um, yeah, I guess that and I'll actually turn it around and say you should use the same copy and paste method in the 3D model. That's right. As well. Yes. In fact, that was what the idea had. Once you know where the texture comes from, you just take the high frequency component of the mesh as well. Uh, we didn't do it because uh, in the end, it looked texture mapped already nice when it was just flat. But uh, it, that, that was a, a, an idea that we had too and thought we might come to it one time. OK, so I'll show you a movie for the texture mapping as well. And there's also. Uh, this is also an older one. It has still here in the flaw. For example, here this wavy that's all uh, gone now. And, uh, but here you can see roughly how, uh, how nicely it fits to each other. That's a 3D structure, and here's that's the texture that gets slapped on. And here that's the yawning that it removed, so I couldn't fill in. OK, so what you get in the end is uh, these kind of facade models. It's a 12-block uh, model of, of downtown Berkeley. So here's the, the, the lower part is texture mapped. The upper part is not, because our camera didn't reach high enough. So we later fill texture mapped that with airborne, or airborne data. 
And, but you, then you can see here that the, the structure of the building is, is still visible here where it's not texture mapped. So this is a different viewpoint. And what you have is just the facades. It's like a, like a Hollywood city. Uh, has no tops in it. What, what causes the gaps? Which gaps, for example, here? Uh, oh, I guess here. those are streets then. Is that what it is? And in this case, it's probably just a yard. A yard. I don't think, I mean, this is a, this is a block, so there's uh, some yard or something. Okay. So your, your algorithms tend to remove sidewalks, it looks like. Right. We have that actually optional. So if, if you want to keep them, then there you have a side, uh, sidewalk area here. And we remove them in the model and because we fuse it later. And then we have the high, uh, the sidewalk here at relatively high resolution, but the rest of the street at low resolution. So we found it better to remove them entirely. But yes, you see, you see the sidewalk too. The, I mean, for the, for the model part of it, it seems like it might be best to keep the edge there and then still use the texture from the lower res aerial shot. You mean having then the, uh, so at least the geometry the edge the sidewalk? The sidewalk that might be a possibility, yeah. But uh, then I would, I think it would might make air sense the other way around, use the texture. Because if the texture is low quality, it doesn't matter how the geometry is, it won't look good, basically. But I guess if you have the, the geometry could be flat, but if you paste a nice picture on it, high resolution, it help. Okay, so for this bigger model, this is basically 12 block, uh, a 12 block model. I only showed you a three and a half block model uh, as, as Verma. This bigger model took 25 minutes acquisition time and uh, almost five hours processing, and it was fully automated though. When you say fully automated, um, I mean, there's not a single manual step of saying this aerial picture. No, there's 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 uh, two two steps which you can say is manual. First one is driving. Okay. The second one is you have to uh, click right now as it is the, the starting point in the DSM or the aerial image because okay. we didn't use an initial G, uh, GPS yeah. estimate or something <coughs> like that roughly within say 10 meters or. In, in an area like that, you have to click. I started roughly there. But that's one click, for, and no matter how long you drive. And it only has to be roughly. You don't have to exactly. No, you just okay. say, like, you, you remember there was this initial rect uh, square distribution of particles for the localization. I think that was probably 10 by 10 meters or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just click roughly, it's there. And, uh, and that speeds it up. It would actually work also if you, uh, if you just randomly distribute them over the town. It would just take longer to find your initial post because you have to carry multiple hypotheses until yeah. you moved and weeded them all out. Yeah. But that's the only step. And you know, you can simply, uh, first you could simply solve that by having a GPS and just uh, uh, getting the readout. Or your alternative is you could, um, uh, yeah, I, I guess that would uh, solve it. Uh, otherwise, it, it doesn't matter because independently whether you model a huge area, it's only one click, it remains one click. So other, otherwise, everything is automated completely. OK, let me uh, come to the airborne modeling part. And that's, uh, as you've seen already, those ground-based models do not contain any information about the terrain or the, the rooftop. So it's, it's like, a, like, as I said, a Hollywood city. And so that doesn't look good for a fly-through. And that's why we also get now uh, <coughs> the, the roofs of the, the terrain from airborne data. And we'll use airborne laser scans. And we use aerial images. So uh, this is the processing uh, pipeline. Basically, we use the scans, process them a bit, and also the images, and register them, and process them to, to come up with the city model. And first about the airborne laser scans, um, we acquired them from from a company, the, uh, the services that uh, you can hire uh, for flying over the city. So we have to uh, first resemble them because they come as an unstructured point cloud and then uh, grid them into a, a, what's called a DSM, a digital surface model. And what you see here is such a, a DSM, what's uh, the lighter color, the higher it is. So tall trees and tall buildings uh, appear lighter. And, um, in that gridding, you also have to uh, fill in some holes. So typically, the edges um, of the buildings um, are a bit fuzzy because you don't have row column. It's a bit random where the scanner hits there. And that's why if you 
simply triangulate that DSM, it doesn't look so good. So this is a triangulation, and it has, it looks very messy. Here you have all these icicles here, and I think I have a slide that shows uh, the details. Uh, the, the two main problem is that you have bumpy rooftops. You have all kind of objects like ventilation ducts on the roofs, or maybe an antenna, something like that. But instead of getting the shape out nicely, you just have one random scan point here, and that makes it look like you have some, some pyramids there. And the, the second problem is jittery edges. You know, the scan points hit somewhere here on the edge, and, um, and it's very random where they hit. And sometimes, actually, because the scanner essentially scans in, in this fashion, if you have a slightly overhanging roof, it would look under the roof, too. So you get some scan points suddenly underneath here, which is, uh, very uh, unpleasant to, uh, for a 3D model reconstruction. So again, we uh, apply a, a series of processing steps in order to come up with some, uh, transform that original DSM in something that looks nicer. Um, we do a segmentation and planner segmentation and just death discontinuities. Yeah, remove small regions, uh, uh, group them to bigger regions and uh, determine the surrounding planes and, uh, for example, uh, small regions like an antenna or something and on top gets then removed and interpolated with that plane just to uh, polygonalize it essentially. And we straighten out the edges also with a ransack. We find the polygonal outlines where possible. And so, so on that, you, you have some set of points that describe the perimeter and you just use random subsets. So, so it's just basically a ransack on the line. Basically, yes. So you have the outline, all the you get all the points. You, you do the ransack, and you you do the, uh, you, know, the fit, how, uh, you determine how, how well the line fits, and then that's that's your polygon, and then it's straightened out along that. And what you get is something that looks nicer, uh, at least more polygonal, and which is uh, easier than for texture mapping and looks better in visualization. So now comes the texture mapping here. And um, what we actually use is we use oblique images. And uh, typically, actually, let me go back first. Typically, when people created 3D city models from an airborne view, they used A, top-down uh, images to get the rooftops and the terrain. And B, they went around and took ground-based images to slap on the facades. Um, the nice thing is you have always a nice viewpoint on it. The bad thing is. The color is usually different, the resolution obviously too, and, uh, and it's very labor intensive from the ground based. And uh, to avoid these transitions, uh, we thought we'll use oblique images which have both rooftop and facades. Because there's a lot of facades that are not even accessible from, uh, from the uh, street level. I mean, the ones that are, we get them with our ground based modeling. But what do you do with the facades that are on the backside? can't just walk in everybody's backyard and it takes too long too. So that's why we, uh, we wanted to use oblique images because um, then you see also these facades on the back side. And uh, also the nice thing is you have the same image for the top and the side so they kind of fit together if you use them. Um, what makes it harder is that you have, uh, you have all six degrees of freedom. You technically have them too if you have a top-down image. But uh, you know, there's only rotation and translation really uh, prominently there. And then uh, what you also have is that the resolution within the image is different. If you have a top-down images, you have more or less one pixel equals a meter. That's how they are actually specified. But if you have oblique images, you have high resolution in the foreground and lower resolution there. Um, yeah. So what I did is I just went up myself in a helicopter and just used the standard five megapixel digital camera and, and took uh, images of, of downtown Berkeley. Yeah. Now we have the, the problem is we have to register those images now uh, with the model first, and um, our idea was that we uh, use the match between the 2D lines that we find in the image and 3D lines from the model, and that's actually mostly the work of one of uh, my students, Rusty Salmond, and um, so that was the principal idea. We find lines here, as you see red in the images, and we find the the green lines here, which are the 3D lines. And if we have a rough idea where we are, we can project those lines uh, into something in the image, and then we can try to find matches or correspondences be between them. So uh, 
what we do is we, we essentially, after, for, a, for a given pose, we can project the, the green lines, which are the 3D lines, into the image and look, are there similar red lines, which is actual image lines, that fit there. And we compare them basically with a quality function that uh, uses the direction and the location of, of the lines. And uh, yeah, we compute the quality value that's over all the lines. And uh, that's a way how we can rate our pose. Um, and, and that's an example is here you have a, uh, this one has a high rating which is considered a good match. And here in this case you're just off by one degree, I think, yeah, one degree, and, and the rating is substantially lower. But, yeah? The 2D red lines from the aerial photographs, um, how are those uh, generated? Are they just looking at pattern recognition, looking for a series of, you know, a contrast? I mean, this, yeah, it's basically a, a line detection algorithm. So okay. the same thing, you, you, you run some line detection algorithm over it, you straighten them out, you know, go along, yeah. uh, find them. Yeah. Uh, and then you threshold them, because the idea is typically long lines are better lines than short lines. So, so for example, the algorithm could perfectly well pick up, say, like the street lines, the Absolutely. white lines painted in the middle of the street. Right, right. right. So how do you get rid of those? We don't. Okay. Th that's why you see them, they're all here. Okay, so that's why that's why when you when you do the when you merge with the green and the red, basically that any red lines that are that are superfluous or are, are not wanted, you know, the green model basically has what you want, right? It it has the right scans. exactly yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, see, there's a lot of issues, and actually we talked about this before. The main problem is that we don't have a 2D image to 2D image registration because then you can use all kind of intensity information to figure out which lines are actually correspondences. Use local features or even feature points rather than lines. But we have only the model and that has only very few feature points, which is the corners uh, or, or the lines that we have. And typically we tried even to uh, find feature points with uh, some Harry's uh, corner detector. And we find like uh, about 1% corresponds to extra 3D features. So that's why uh, we tried originally ransack type pose estimation and that failed. It's just too many, too few good points compared to overall points that you have. It never picks the right four or five ones, you know, how many you need. And um, so then we, we did it line based and hoping that, that this is better and it still picks out a lot of bad lines. And that makes it difficult somewhat. I mean you can see we already played some tricks um, here, for example, it didn't catch the shadow lines. In principle it d detects all intensity lines. Um, uh, I think there's thresholding actually for this one, I don't know. Yeah. So there's, there's, uh, there's the length, I think we also have a criteria how the color changes between the two sides of the lines to figure out what are better lines come with something. But there's still a lot of bad lines. And, um, and that actually, and then I'll show this on the next slide, the result of that is that you have a very spiky quality function. And this is actually here already the case where all, uh, this is shown the case where all um, uh, parameters that we have are good except one, and it's still kind of a rather narrow peak. Yeah. If, if you compare them and use the position and the orientation, you can, uh, you have influence of uh, what lines you would still consider con contributing or being good lines. And if you make this very wide or tolerant, you get a lot of wrong matches. And uh, if you make it, uh, so you have to make it kind of narrow narrow catch range in order to really get the true, true maximum. So there was a lot of issues with that. And the bottom line is, um, so far we couldn't get it run in a, in a very fast way. We, our approach right now is we simply step through the parameter space. And it works good enough if we have a good initial is estimate. And then we can actually find the true pose. But if we have no information, uh, about our initial pose, it gets difficult because the search range is seven dimensional. In our case, even the, the focal length was also uh, a uh, search area because we only use the not accurate recorded focal length. So you have to step through all of them to catch them. And, uh, and because of it, it's, uh, so it has so many local maxima, steepest descent is not really, really applicable. Um, here, here, what I show here is, um, how the search range actually influences the usefulness of this, this algorithm. So if you don't know anything, it takes a million years <laughs> to step, you know, an entire city. You go in, a, in I don't, 10 meter steps or 5 meter steps to an entire city and all degrees of freedom. You search forever. Um, 
and, and then it goes down. And I mean, up in the sky, GPS is very accurate because there's, uh, it doesn't get, doesn't get blocked by facades. So you can, if you assume something like that, um, zero meters, or you get centimeter accuracy, and uh, and even just a mid-tier INS has five degree, um, a five degree precision. Actually, they have usually one degree. Then you, it drops down dramatically. So if you have this kind of sensors, our approach works pretty well, I would say, and it's useful in context. If you don't, then that's probably not the right right way to go. So we just simulated those results by know, having uh, finding the true pose based on uh, manual matching and then adding errors to it. But uh, in the future, we intended to, to buy actually an INS and go up there and take the images. I, I think you mentioned when we were just talking before that you didn't exploit vanishing points. Right, we didn't. But for yes. that image, it seems like there's a lot of vanishing point information. That's true, yes. Yes, so you could potentially use that. I mean, one thing is that vanishing points, my knowledge, work better if you have rectangular buildings and things like that. And it turns out that actually our street pattern is not. It has always an angle in Berkeley for whatever reason. So the buildings and blocks are not, not rectangular buildings. Well, there's just one diagonal street, right? Everything else is gridded. No, no, no. The whole grid is kind of skewed somewhere. <laughs> yeah, so that makes it harder. But you can still weed out because you actually know, you know how it is skewed. But that makes it you have more degrees of freedom depending on right. what, what well, the skew angle is. The vertical vanishing point already nails two of the rotational That's elements, true. right? And then there's just one roll Absolutely. left. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That that would be a good idea to go. Actually, I've, uh, I've been on uh, some conference. I've di been discussing with people vanishing point, and they said they think it should work. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Could, could you try to register the ground based symmetry with the aerial? Yeah. Exactly. That was one idea that I had because. Say so if you if you just use the ground based uh, the the facades and try to find that in the image, right. you could that's the point. There you know the geometry and the two D information. You could nail that exactly. That was also one idea. Okay, uh, so once you know the, where the pose is of the the image and you know the location where it was taken from, you can start. Uh, with fusing those images together. And uh, typically, because we have these oblique images and we want to cover all of the area on all sides, we have a lot of redundancy. From that area of uh, downtown Berkeley, I said 17 images that I took. Uh, a lot of them show the same kind of buildings, maybe from different sides, but maybe also from the same side. So you have to pick which one it is. And typically, you have these panoramic views, too. In the background, you see, you see everything, but at very low resolution. So. We basically assign a score where we take into account the resolution. Obviously, we want to have the maximum amount of pixel that falls into that um, uh, triangle. Visibility. Um, so we want to have, uh, uh, of course, something that's not occluded. And it turns out, actually, that sometimes it's better to accept a small occlusion somewhere and have a high resolution then throwing out the image entirely and put something really blocky in there. So it's kind of a bit of a trade-off that we made here, too. And important, obviously, is also the normal vector. The best is the, the direct view. So out of these, we, we uh, um, <coughs> assign a score and a preliminary um, texture uh, on image uh, identifier. And then we, after that, we come and we apply a neighborhood consistency. So we have a voting scheme that goes in a local area and tries to uh, minimize the effects that you have, get scattering from different images. One is, you know, one trying is image five, the other one is image three. That typically happens when, um, oh, and it's not, I don't have those slides. That typically happens in areas where you have two very similar images, equally bad or equally good, and, uh, and you have some, then some small bumpiness on, on a building. And the small changes in normal vectors decide already which image to take. So you want to minimize those effects. And that's already uh, after smoothing out. So here it would be very jittery at those boundaries. And uh, here too. And there's also some, because our, essentially our 3D model is not perfect. It's automatically generated. You can see there's some cracks here in this, in this building. And that's a drastic change in normal orientation. And it would also pick a different um, 
different image for texture mapping here at this small cracks, but with this local neighborhood filtering, this voting scheme, it uh, removes those and, and picks the, uh, the image that fits with the neighborhood. It's a small enough change here. So yeah, what you see is here, this, um, different colors indicate different images that are used for texture mapping. And basically, the, the final step for the texture mapping is, because we have so many images, and uh, things are so redundant, it's not efficient to use those images as texture. We have to pack it somehow together. And right now, we simply just put it in one big image and change the texture coordinates accordingly. And, uh, and that takes care uh, of it. That reduces the texture a lot. Um, there have been also several approaches of how to uh, pack those texture patches together. So we don't do it at a triangle level, but we do it on a region level. So um, yeah, I, I don't have these, uh, these slides here. But typically, there's a, because we have this neighborhood filtering, there's really connected regions. So we segment them out, and we place in the entire region in a uh, copy-paste method. And we first start with the big regions, and then like packing a suitcase, pack in the smaller regions until finally um, this, the small gaps get filled with a very small small regions. And the graphics card takes care of the whole mess. And uh, open rendering it looks all nice, you wouldn't see. <laughs> OK, uh, so this is uh, then the result. That's the airborne model only. So uh, you can see that it, uh, maybe you remember that we had some, uh, there were some discontinuities here. And you, you don't really see them. Uh, so from an airborne view, it looks uh, mostly reasonable. And um, the only thing is the facades that look here nice. If you would zoom in, it would all be blocky. Because here you're still far away. But if you want to do a walk through, you have these big pixel blocks. That, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, have you considered view dependent texture mapping for any of this? And yeah. Um, basically, um, we haven't done it. We considered it, doing it at one point. And, uh, and we didn't do it uh, for, for um, several reasons. The, the most one is that um, our models are already fairly big. <laughs> so it's hard to render them. If you, you know, the texture, then that's why I don't show the full model here. It's hard on this laptop. If you use two or three texture samples, it's, it gets even and bigger. Yeah. And you have also then issues. The rendering gets more complicated in general. What ha you know, which areas you have to swap and things like that. Yeah. OK, this is a, an, an airborne uh, view again. Yeah, there's no ground based on that. OK, so finally, I come here to the, the model fusion, how we put those two models together. And that's now fairly uh, straightforward in some sense, because um, the registration, which is one of the hardest problems in the fusion, is already solved. Uh, remember the Monte Carlo localization that we had? did exactly that. It registered the ground-based data nicely to the airborne reference. So uh, you can say, even though DSM might be off, it still registers it nicely, so, which means you always are as accurate globally in terms of shifts as your DSM is, but locally accurate as to where the ground -based, uh, how accurate the ground-based data is. So you register them together, and now the task that's left is just to create a consistent model out of these two modalities. And you can see here, in this case, um, th there are just the two models on top of each other. And at some places, the ground-based data is on, on top of it, and, and the others, the airborne data is on top of it. And that just doesn't look good. OK, so what we do is, because we know where our localization is, actually, so we can mark. Uh, we, we do the, uh, start the fusion already in the airborne model generation process. So we can mark the, uh, the areas where we have ground-based data. And we just don't generate airborne data uh, for that at all. So, but that does it. It basically leaves the facades empty where we have ground-based data. And what we have to do now is we put in the, the ground-based data, as you see here. And what's shown in blue here are the not texture mapped uh, parts of it. And now we have to. Um, to fuse those together. And that's actually a, a bit an ill-defined problem and a complicated problem, how to fuse those, those two meshes consistently. 
but we apply a simple nice trick and that uh, works surprisingly well is we, we put in a blend mesh so we have this here and we extrude it towards uh, away from the facades and uh, so we put in triangle here that fit there we extrude them away from the facades and then we lock it to the the, the airborne model and that's shown here yeah we place that in and it's not actually connected it's it, uh, in the mesh it just lies on the same um, basically it just touches each other but if you texture map it then uh, you don't notice that so even though it's not watertight for visualization purposes that looks perfectly fine and uh, because it's the same texture on it even though you move you don't see you don't see that and yeah so what you see here is this is the airborne texture and it, you see it kind of a nice uh, aligns even though the resolution is lower and the color is slightly different because that was taken at a, a different time of the year even and time of the day yeah and this is an example where um, you have again the the, uh, the top comes from aerial images and this comes from the ground-based uh, data acquisition and here's another another example for that okay uh, adjust for the color for the lighting uh, we haven't tried it yes but that would be an idea exactly you obviously have lots of data yeah you could do that yes yeah we could also use so of course color is the first thing to do and that's rather straightforward um, what you could also do is try because typically building features are very similar from one one floor to the other. You could use this as a, as, a, as your uh, as your template image and and to basically uh, generate texture artificially um, by using those elements. You know, you you, have, you copy this and look where does it fit. And you would place it and create high resolution texture artificially. Is there a reason why you don't have a, just a second camera pointing out? Uh, well, the, the true reason is we didn't have a second camera when yeah. we acquired the data. Each data acquisition yeah, it, took it, some time um, to mount everything. Um, uh, but there's another good reason why we didn't point this one higher up. And that's if you point it up too high, then the sun comes in. Yeah, and you get very... Uh, you know, um, pink images and all kind of saturation effects. So that, that's not really good, good to do. And there's always will always be a limitation, because uh, yeah, there's always tall buildings where you can't see the top, and that has ultimately to come from the airborne view. Okay, this seen already, and this is a fly-through view. But you can actually download this model if you want to look at it. Uh, the website. The website is here uh, shown, and then you can use a vermal player to look at everything and convince yourself whether you like it or not. Okay, so uh, here's some publication about that work. Uh, I guess it's all on, on my website too. Uh, and um, some future work. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll speed up the automated registration uh, of aerial images more and use uh, maybe some additional uh, features uh, so, um, like vanishing points and, and uh, such things to uh, reduce the search space and um, um, yeah the, that's basically uh, the main part in this respect we also want to use actual sensors I didn't put this this in here um, that we want to really get an INS and do the same thing and not just a simulation but having the, um, the, the true results and um, we want to also work on the more model refinement, especially we want to work on tree areas because our approach that I showed so far assumes somewhat nice building structures, reasonable buildings, not too many trees around. We can remove some of the trees. But what do you do in residential areas where there's a lot of trees and very little buildings? And uh, that's, that's a complicated problem that we'll intend to work on. And uh, the fact right now that we remove the ground-based uh, uh, foreground objects is also uh, not always desirable. Sometimes you want to have those features. In fact, there's, there's some people that are interested in knowing what those features are. Say, is it a straight sign or is it in, uh, when it's have some classification? Which is um, easier to do if you have the 3D information. That helps you a lot, not just detecting street signs and images, but you can 
actually get the, the um, 3D shape of it. And what we also want to do is we want to uh, turn this system into a portable system. So it's more flexible. You can either mount it on a car or you can just carry it as a backpack. Because right now we only model outdoor environments. And there has been work that uses mobile robots in indoor environments. Um, actually, that's how the, most of the modeling started. But I feel like there's still not, um, these indoor environments are still not a solved problem because they can typically only make a model for uh, some confined environments and no stairs, for example. Ultimately, I would like to have something like an entire model of the, say, Berkeley campus. You can go in every building, go up the stairs, go some small trails, and uh, even those little robot-based approaches, they don't do that, can't, can't do it. So a portable system uh, would be what, what would be necessary for that, which brings a lot of um, new issues because you have more motion and, and things like that. And uh, something that we just started recently is um, to update 3D models dynamically. Uh, we have here moving objects such as cars and tanks. Uh, that's probably the left mainly from our Murray presentation um, in, in Washington. And um, we would like to, to add to the 3D model that we have those dynamic components. Um, say we, uh, for ex and there are several ways of doing it. We started an approach, dynamic scene modeling, um, that has structured infrared light so that it's not visible, even in, in visible cameras that get the texture of it. And whoever's interested in uh, getting more information about that uh, can can talk to me uh, offline, but there's also uh, you could, for example, place a stationary camera, and because if you know this is the model how it always looks like, you just render how the model look like would look like from that view and get the difference images. Even even if you move the camera, as long as you know where you are, you can dynamically get what's the difference and what's what's moving there. So that's the direction uh, to go. Okay, so this is the end of my talk. Thank More you. question? Yeah? In future work, have you considered merging 3D with sort of image based? Um, image based rendering? Rendering. Because um, as, you, as you go to organic objects like trees or indoor environments where there's really complicated fabrics. That's right, yes. With 3D. Like 3D is, is going to limit. That's true. I, uh, yeah, you can model every leaf of a, of a tree. Um, we haven't done, and uh, we haven't really spent much thought about uh, doing that image based. What we thought we would do is we'll do a more uh, vision type solution that we find the trees where they are and then replace them by a generic tree that uh, you know, has the right shape and maybe even the right type. And that one tree you can model pretty well. You make one where it has a high resolution texture and you shape the tree so that it fits in there. I think that would actually be good enough. Um, and that has one advantage, and that's that the storage uh, requirements are a lot less. It's image based it looks all, always very, very good, but it explodes. It goes to gigabytes, even for smaller areas. That's, uh, but uh, yeah, in terms of quality, and uh, especially also things that uh, if you move away from the, your local model into the, into the horizon, there's no way that you can really render that. Um, based on polygons. I have said at one point you have to do at least some imposter images. Um, so it seems to me like you benefit from having a, a, a slightly forward facing side scanning laser as well because then right now as you pass by trees it's, it's completely occluded behind there. Whereas if you had a, a second side scanning laser that could get behind the trees, you right. could yes. get quite a bit more information. Then. Yes. That's true. We sh uh, should have one, and that was one of our ideas to, to mount one on the on the side too. So, given the level of automation that you've achieved, which is quite impressive, does that mean that you're ready to, for example, uh, go to downtown Oakland and get in your helicopter and, scan and have somebody drive around and, and within literally a day generate another a similar? That's true. That's uh, basically the. Uh, the principal idea, and in, in principle, that works. Um, now, when I say completely automa automated, yeah. it is that you still have things like from one file to the other that you have to say, you know, start this part of the model. The, the processing chain itself, for example, you have to copy the data. So, but uh, in uh, one day seems uh, realistic to me. So, 
if you look at the data acquisition time, in, in fact, uh, we are right now in the process of uh, commercializing the system, and the requirements are not one day, but it's uh, 2x processing speed. So that means you drive for one hour, and you get the model in half an hour. So that's uh, at least uh, our objective, or what we want to reach. Um, are, are you working on uh, a rendering engine as well? Because it seems like VRML is starting to hit its limitations. It does, <laughs> it does. Yes, actually, one of our students worked on rendering engine. And uh, we got, I would say, somewhat fair results, not perfect results. Uh, essentially, what this rendering engine does, it dynamically swaps things out either from graphics card to memory and from memory to, to the disk. And uh, right now, the interactive rendering uh, has still its, its limitation. It takes a while to load it, so you have to wait until it finally converges. Uh, I wouldn't say it's finished work, but yeah, we've done steps in that direction. Um, you had mentioned again when we were talking something about how hard this gets in residential areas with right. the trees and strange things. Have you done any experiments that you think this general technique extends or it doesn't? That we have right now? Yeah. And um, we drove through residential areas and uh, model of that. So what happens is, and exactly as you pointed out, with the, we have only one laser scanner that scans the site. So if you imagine a typical residential uh, scene, uh, uh, at least in Berkeley, there's always a lot of trees around. And then uh, there's two things that kill us. First, you have only occluding objects. And we even detect them as trees in the foreground. But if we remove them, there's not much left. There's only, you know, maybe once in a while you had a view through the, the building. And then once, if there's not much left, that typically gets thrown away too as saying outliers if it's too small and it's something strange. And, um, and yeah, if you used uh, two scanners, then that would help to see at least somewhat more. And so, so that's one problem. The occlusion gets uh, is substantially higher there. The other problem is that typically in, in residential areas where you have more trees, the building shapes get also a lot more, not complex, but you have smaller buildings with more features. If you go downtown type scenarios, you have often larger buildings. If you apply a segmentation, you can easily say this is a building. Even though it has more complex shape, you, you know that this is a building. But if uh, your building gets small, the noise in the laser scan data brings it already, already cl almost close to a tree. Uh, even though you have small you know, roofs here and there, and there's some little feature, um, and the tree right next to it, it becomes hard to distinguish them from, from each other. So uh, yeah, th that's why our current approach is the idea that we remove everything what we think is a tree, and well, actually keep it somewhere else, but we separate what it is uh, from a tree. And then we, uh, what's left, then we try to polygonalize that. And, uh, and then uh, in, the, in the segmented tree areas, we figure out where's the tree and maybe find out where's the center, where's the trunk, and replace that by an artificial tree. That, that seems right now to me the best way to go, deal with those issues. data in the imagery that you're collecting itself. In the, in the ground base. In the, yeah, the ground based photographs. Right. Have you thought about using stereo reconstruction techniques at all and to try to augment the laser scans with that? Uh, yes, yes. Essentially, um, we, have done, we have done something like that. Um, we found that it's not as reliable as laser scans. That, that might be our fault. <laughs> so maybe somebody else would do a better job. I, we had. Actually, the, uh, once we try to fill in the holes where we right now interpolate data with, uh, with data obtained from stereo vision. Yeah. And we found that it's, uh, it's more noisy in general oh, really? than just uh, filling it in. And it fails often, because typically areas where you have to fill in things contain also a lot of windows see, yeah. with reflections. And see, in an urban environment, it's very complicated. And uh, I think, actually, those. Um, purely image-based reconstruction methods are very impressive for the example that they show. And if you can, a camera is the way to go. It's cheaper, it's easy portable. Um, 
But there's a lot of situation, I think, where cameras have difficulties now, and they will probably have them in the foreseeable future. If you have reflecting objects, if it's really complicated, you have foreground here and there. But I guess so. the laser has problems with reflecting objects, too. Like, like window, windows are still a problem. For but the not laser. that, too, but not, the, in, not so much. I see. For example, the reflecting, it's, it's true. Um, if it's entirely reflecting, you, get, uh, you, you don't get a signal it gets just, unless you're just facing it directly. But often windows have still, uh, say for example, you have a curtain behind it, you get the curtain, and which you don't with a camera, you just get the, the sky from somewhere else. Or if the window is slightly dirty, like a 10% reflection is already, or 10% scattering is already usually good enough to, to get something there, only really clean windows. But with a camera, even if you have, uh, you know, the, just the reflecting part is still dominant because it's not active. You mentioned that you're commercializing this. Can you talk, uh, say a little bit about, about that, please? Uh, I would actually like not. Sure. Uh, well, we are about to uh, get a contract. OK. So. so any more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.